Um, I want to talk a little bit about the general book of Tehillim. So, you know, when we look at Tehillim, uh, well, the first thing I think that we know that we note when we when we encounter Tehillim is how much everybody loves Tehillim, right? And this is just a very beloved book. It's one that I think many of us use in many different occasions. There seems to be a mise more for every occasion, right? Um, and it's always been a very beloved book. It's actually when, when we found the uh, caves in Qumran with, uh, with about 220 biblical manuscripts, the, the book that was represented the most was Tehillim. Okay, so it, apparently it was a very popular book then as well. Um, what accounts for the general appeal of Tehillim? Well, first of all, I think it's important to note that this book um, is, it, it records the act of human beings who are describing their religious experience, which makes it really unlike most of biblical poetry. Right? Most of biblical poetry, or a lot of biblical poetry, certainly biblical prophecy, uh, is about God's message to humans. Right? And Mizmori Tehillim allows human beings a certain, um, uh, a certain forum uh, uh, for expressing their religious experience within the context of the Tanakh. So this is something I think that explains on one level why the Mizmori Tehillim are something that appeals so much to us. Um, at the same time, I think that we note, especially I, I know that a lot of you have been learning the Mizmori Tehillim, that we note as we're reading through the Mizmori Tehillim that there's an incredible harnessing of a broad range of human emotions as part of our religious experience, right? And that also, I think, is something that accounts for it very broad appeal. So we have, you know, Mizmorim, which describe uh, joy, and Mizmorim, which describe sadness. We have Mizmorim, which describe awe, and we have Mizmorim that describe yearning. We have Mizmorim that describe fear, and we have Mizmorim that describe despair, right? So we have this very broad range of uh, descriptions of the human experience, the human religious experience, and I think it's the depth, the range of these emotions, which again accounts for its appeal. But until now, I'm really just talking in general about why I think that Sefer Tehillim is such a beloved book. But what I really want to discuss tonight is a much more specific question, which is, does Sefer Tehillim tell a story? Is this a book, right, in the way that we usually understand books? Uh, when we first look at the book, we tend to see 150 separate and distinct mizmorim. Each one is autonomous, right? We would call it an anthology of mizmorim or an anthology of religious songs or songs that describe the religious experience. It seems to be erratic. It doesn't seem to be necessarily organized in any clear um, fashion, right? So at first glance, the answer that I would give is, no, right? Sefer Tehillim does not tell a story. It doesn't even really seem to be a book. It's probably better termed an anthology, right? And this is the way that I think most of the biblical interpreters have interpreted Tehillim during the course of the history of, of, of interpretation. Uh, generally speaking, the book has been treated as 150 separate and distinct chapters each of which has its own autonomous idea, right, or 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 set of ideas. Um, and the question that you know that I want to ask is is first and foremost before we even get to the question of whether or not it tells a story is um, is there any organization at all to say for a team? And in order to 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 answer the question of whether it tells a story, you have to begin by saying that the book is organized deliberately. Uh, I might ask this question in a bit of a different way. Let's say I were to take the 150 Mizmori Tehillim, right, and put them, you know, each one in a hat and mix it up and emerge with a different order. Would it be the same book, right? Would it be the same book? Now, I think uh, on some level, we have to keep in mind that we do do that sometimes, right? We take the liberty of restructuring the Mizmori Tehillim in our tefillot. Right? So think of Kabbalat Shabbat, or uh, not Psuke de Zimra that we say every day, but the Psuke de Zimra that we say on Shabbat, right? So we take the Mizmori Tehillim and we sort of, you know, we pull out a few and, you know, there, there might be a, a somewhat of an order, but we don't feel bound by the order, okay? We don't feel bound by the order. And what's interesting is, is that one of the most um, 
complete scrolls that we found in Qumran, going back to the Mizmorei Tehillim that we found in Qumran, it's actually called the Tehillim scroll. It's a beautiful scroll. It's a very, um, a, a very almost a, a complete scroll. I mean, the bottom part is missing, but um, but it's a it's a it's a very uh, considered to be a very well preserved scroll. It was found in Cave 11, and it has 41 Mizmorei Tehillim, not in order, most of which are from the end of the book, and seven Mizmorim which don't appear in Tehillim, right? Now again, so you sort of look at this and you say, oh wow, did the people in Qumran have a different order, a different Sefer Tehillim? Maybe not, maybe that was their sitter, okay? Imagine if a thousand years from now somebody finds a sitter, right? What might they say about our Sefer Tehillim, right? They might say, wow, that's a really different Sefer Tehillim than the one that I have, right? Okay, all of this just really to give you a sense that we do take liberties with the order of Sefer Tehillim. We don't necessarily feel, feel bound to it, certainly not within the context of tefillah. And yet, anybody who's really spent any time reading through Sefer Tehillim, and this is a favorite activity of a lot of people. I mean, it's a long book, but, but oftentimes you see women sitting at the Kotel, right? And they're reading from Aleph all the way through Kuf, Kuf, uh, Kuf Nun, right? Um, uh, people, people love to say, Sefer Tehillim, and when you are reading through Sefer Tehillim, I think you begin to get a sense that there is an order here, that it's not exactly a random collection of 150 separate chapters. I'll begin by just telling you some things that I think you already know, just to establish that this is the case. Um, there, we have you know, certain Mizmori Tehillim that seem to appear in clusters or collections, right? Think, for example, of the Shir HaMa'alot, right? We have 15 Mizmari Tehillim, which are the Shirei HaMa'alot. So you're not going to take one of them out of there and, you know, stick it at the beginning of the book, right? That's clearly a cluster. It clearly is a collection that belongs together. Uh, we have a collection of Mizmori Asaf, which appear together with one exception, right? Ein Gimel through Pe Gimel are Mizmori Asaf. And then we have a Mizmor Asaf in Nun. Okay, don't ask me why, right? But for the moment, just to get a sense, Mizmori Asaf uh, represent a collection of Mizmori Tilim. The Mizmori Bnei Korach appear in two clusters, okay? So what we're getting a sense is, is that there is an order here, right? We have Halel HaGadol, which appears together. Halel HaKatan, which appears together, right? There's some sort of um, method, at least to these internal collections, which seem to have some sort of internal cohesion. Um, there is a, uh, there are, we know that we have uh, 11, maybe 12 Mizmori Tilim that have what we call a historical superscription, right? A historical title, okay? Uh, these are the Mizmori Tilim that are linked to some event in David HaMelech's life. Um, now, they're somewhat scattered, so, you know, we have one in Gimel, and then we, will, we have one in Yudchet, but they're heavily concentrated in the Nuns, right? The Nuns and the Samachs, right? So there is a sense, again, that there's some sort of cohesion, that there's some sort of method there, okay? So that's one, I think, indication that says to us, there's, there, this isn't random. It's not slapdash. It's not somebody just coming and saying, well, we have a whole bunch of nice songs. Let's just stick them into a book, and it doesn't matter what the order is. There is some sense of structure. Okay, now, I want to offer a couple more pieces of evidence that shows that there is more structure than one might think in uh, Sefer Tehillim, and then I want to talk a little bit about uh, what it means that Sefer Tehillim might be telling a story, okay? But I, I just want to say a few more things about what shows us that there's something not random going on here. There's something very deliberate going on here. Um, the, the, um, the, the, one of the ideas, I think, that we have often in Sefer Tehillim, or one of the ways that indicates that Sefer Tehillim really is composed very deliberately, is that Oftentimes, Mizmarim are placed next to each other in a deliberate manner. This is often indicated linguistically. I'm going to give you a few examples, okay? Now, for the moment, I'm just talking about um, Mizmarim that don't necessarily have a thematic connection, 
but they have a linguistic connection. Okay, so I'm going to show you one, which I think is really a magnificent example, um, and it's uh, the Tumis Marim that I don't know if, if um, how many kihilot say this, say these two mizmorim, during mincha of Shabbos when they're putting away the Sefer Torah. Right? I know that it is said in Nusach Sfarad in our shul. Right? When the chazan is Nusach Sfarad, I always say, oh, I'm so happy. We're going to say those two mizmorim when it's this, Because we, you know, we, we vary the Nusach of the tefillah according to the chazan, whoever is, whoever is davening, that's what we say. And when he's davening the Sech Sfarad, and they're, putting, and they're closing up the Sefer Torah, we say Mizmarim Kuf Yud Aleph and Kuf Yud Bet. You familiar with these Mizmarim? Open your Sefer Tilim to Kuf Yud Aleph and Kuf Yud Bet. And I want you to get a sense that these two Mizmarim are not just deliberately placed side by side, but that they actually constitute a pair. I, I, I really think that you can't understand one without understanding the other. They're meant to be read one in juxtaposition with the other. So look, for example, in Kuf Yud Alf. We're not going to read the homies more, but I want you to get a little bit of a sense of what it is that I'm talking about here. Look at uh, Kuf Yud Alf, Pasuk Alf, Hallelujah, Ode Adonai Bechol Levav Besod Yisharim Ve'eda. Right? We are praising God Bechol Levav. Gidolim maase Adonai, dirushim lechol chiftsehem. Right, God's works are great; they are sought after by all those who desire them. Hod vehadar poalo vitzidkato omedet laad. God's righteousness is established forever. Zecher asal and iflot hav chanun virachum Hashem. And I'm going to stop there for the moment. Okay, this is a mizmor that describes. God's greatness. It describes God's greatness uh, in, in many different aspects. Now I want you to look at Kuf Yud Bet, okay? Kuf Yud Bet starts as follows. Hallelujah. Ashrei ish yarei et Adonai. B'mitzvotav chafetz me'od. Here, who are we praising? Not God, but the man, right? Ashrei ish yarei et Hashem. Happy is the man who fears God. Gibor ba'aretz yez zar'o dor yisharim yivorach. We have that word yisharim again. Hon va'osher b'veito. He has wealth in his household. Look at the next words. V'tzidkato omedet la'ad. Okay? And his righteousness endures forever. Zarach b'choshech or la yisharim chanun v'rachum v'tzadik. You see it? It's mirroring. The entire mizmor mirrors the previous one, such that you have, in one means more, you have the word Yesharim, in the other you have Yesharim. In one you have Yivarach, in the other you have Yivarach. In one you have Vitzit Kato Medet Lad, in the other you have Vitzit Kato Medet Lad. In one God is being described as Hanun Verachum, and in Kuf Yud Bet, the God-fearing man is described as Hanun Verachum. To the best of my knowledge, there is nowhere in Tanakh where the words Hanun Verachum describe human beings, right? And, and here, I think that the, the, the point of these two mizmorim is to suggest that if man wants to be godlike in his ways, he can do so. If he is yarei et Hashem, he can somehow absorb some of the ways of God that are deserving of praise, okay? And there's a lot more to say about these two mizmorim. I'm just sort of briefly drawing your attention to them. It's not our subject right now, but I do want you to emerge from this with two thoughts. One is that you have to read these mizmorim to you more, right? These two, right? Kuf Yud Alf, Kuf Yud Bet are really magnificent um, uh, uh, pair of mizmorim to you. And the other is, is that they're delibor deliberately playing off of each other, right? This is not a coincidence. These two mizmorim certainly go together. Now, that having been said, I want to show you that what I really think is, is that all of the mizmorim are deliberately placed one next to the other, which again, still doesn't say that they're telling a story, but it certainly says that there is something deliberate that is going on here in the artistic, artistic structuring of the book, okay? Now, I, I can't really show you everything because we do have 150 Mizmori Tehilim, but I will just take you to the very beginning. Let's see a few of the beginning of the opening Mizmorim. I want you to get a little bit of a sense of how linguistically connected these Mizmori Tehilim are when they're placed one next to the other, such that they seem to almost flow one into the other. So look in our first Mizmor, Ashrei 
Ha'ish asher lo halach ba'atzat reshaim. That's how we open Mizmori Tilim with the word Ashrei. Happy is the man. This man is happy. Look in Pasuk Bet. Ki im b'torat Hashem chefzo v'torato yehege yomam v'layla. Right? He is always dwelling on God's instructions. And look in the last Pasuk here. Ki yodea Hashem derech tzadikim v'derech reshaim toved. Okay? Now, um, Look in, um, at, uh, God knows the ways of the righteous and the ways of the evil ones will be lost. Okay, now look in our uh, next Mizmor. Look in Perak Bet, Pasuk Av. Lama ragshu goyim ulilmim yehegu rik. You see that word, yehege? We just had it, right? But the, 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 in the first Mizmor, it was people who were dwelling on Torah. And here we have the nations that are dwelling on Torah. Emptiness, okay? Look in uh, uh, Pasuk Yud Bet in Perak Bet, right? The very end of the Mizmor. Nashkuvar penyan yenaf vitovdu derech. You see it? Derech toved, tovdu derech. I don't even have to explain it, right? I'm not, right now I'm not teaching you these Mizmorim. I just want you to get a sense that there is a linguistic flow. Of course, at the end of Pasuk Yud Bet, we have Ashrei ko Jose. Vo, okay, Ashrei, Ashrei, Yehegu, Yehegu, Derech Toved, Derech Toved, right? There's, there's definitely some, there's a very strong connection between Aleph and Bet, but I want to take you a little bit farther just so that you see that this really does seem to continue, okay? So, for example, if you look in, in Paragimel, you have um, Paragimel, Pasuk Gimel, Rabim Omrim Linafshi, okay? Now look in Parag Dalid, Pasuk Zion, Rabim Omri Mir Aini, okay? I mean, this goes on and on and on. I, 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 I just want you to get a little bit of a sense that there is a certain flow from one Mizmor into the next that is a linguistic flow, okay? Now, the linguistic flow may not necessarily mean that there's a story going on, right? It may just mean that there is some sort of artistic structuring, but there definitely seems to be something deliberate going on here so that the answer to the question that I posed earlier, which is that if you take all the Mizmeri Tilim and you shake them up and then you reconstitute them, does that work? The answer seems to be probably not, okay? Certainly not in terms of the what we call the clusters, the collections, the internal collections in Mizmeri Tilim, but I think it's not going to work across the board. I'm going to show you one more example, which I think is really a magnificent example of the deliberate structuring of the different Mizmari Tilim. And then I'm going to turn to our question as to whether or not Sefer Tilim tells a story. Um, this, this example actually uh, 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 it seems to be an example of framing. Okay, We have um, Mizmor Chet. You familiar with Mizmor Chet? A lot, most people are familiar with the Mizmor Tilim that are uh, that 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 are part of Tefillah. Uh, this Mizmor itself, to the best of my knowledge, doesn't appear in in any Nusach of Tefillah that I know of. But it's a wonderful Mizmor, and it's a Mizmor which uh, seems to be a, a very important Mizmor for people. I think people are a little bit more familiar with this Mizmor because this Mizmor describes the experience of human beings. Who are contending with this dialectic of their smallness and their majesty, right? Their majesty and their humility, right? This man is standing here and describing how he is looking at the skies. Look in Pasuk Dalad, Kier Es Shamecha Maase Etzbeotecha Yareach Lechochavim Asher Konanta. When I stand on the earth and I look up at the heavens and I see all of the great heavenly bodies that you, God, have created. Ma enosh ki tizkerenu. What is man that you remember him? Right. This is a very, I think, dramatic mizmor. It's a very powerful mizmor. I think it speaks to a very essential uh, human experience. Okay, now, I'm not going to talk about that mizmor now either, but I am drawing your attention to this mizmor because what I want you to see is that this mizmor is deliberately framed in Sefer Tilim by the end of Perak Zion and the beginning of Perak Tet. Okay, so we have Perak Chet, which is placed carefully between Zion and Tet. Look at the last pasuk of Perak Zion. You'll see what I mean. Perak Zion, pasuk Yud Chet. You see where I am? Everybody has a Tanakh, right? Okay, Perak Zion, pasuk Yud Chet. Ode Hashem ketzidko va'azamra shem Hashem elyon. I praise God 
at, like his righteousness, and I will sing to the name of the Supreme God. Okay, now look in Perak Tet, Pasuk Bet. Aleph is just a title, right? Odeh Hashem Bechol Libi. Now look in Pasuk Kimmel. Esmecha ve'al tzavach azamra shimcha elyon. You see it? It's the same words. Odeh Hashem azamra shem elyon. Odeh Hashem azamra shem elyon. Now, if I were properly teaching Sefer Tehillim right now, certainly if I were properly teaching Perichet, I would have to explain why we have this particular frame for Perichet. But because I'm not doing that, it's enough for me that you see that there is a deliberate frame that is created around Perichet. Perichet is placed within the context of this frame, the end of Perich Zion, the beginning of Perichet. If that's not deliberate artistry, then I don't know what is, okay? So all I really want to emerge with at this point is the sense that Sefer Tilim is put together in a purposeful manner. This is not some sort of slapdash, random collection of 150 different Mizmore Tilim. It doesn't mean that the Mizmore Tilim don't function each one in its own right. In other words, I certainly wouldn't suggest that we are not meant to see each of these prakim as separate and distinct and autonomous and containing an independent message. But I think that we also have to think a little bit more deeply about the larger book because so much care seems to have been put into the arrangement of the book. So I want to ask us, I want to ask ourselves, we want to ask ourselves, does this mean that there is a larger pattern? Does this mean that the Mizmore Tihilim have some sort of continuous idea? Can we read the book from the beginning to the end as if it is telling a story? Okay? This is not the way that traditional scholarship has read Sefer Tihilim. There is a very strong trend today in modern biblical scholarship to do that, to search for some sort of continuous idea in the Mizmore Tehillim. And even if we do look for some sort of continuous idea, I think all of us are going to uh, understand and admit that even if we say that there is some sort of story, this isn't this isn't a story like Sefer Shoftim is a story, right? It's not a story like, uh, uh, you know, like Sefer Shmuel. It's not even a story like Shira Shirim, which is also a book of poetry that seems to have a continuous theme. But that's more of a story than I think Sefer Tehillim could ever be. But what I want to see is if we can discern any sort of storyline, any sort of continuous progressive idea throughout the 150 Mizmori Tehillim. I think it's pretty obvious to you that if I'm asking the question, I think that the answer must be yes. Otherwise, I could probably send you all home with one big no. Um, but, but again, I, without, without, I think, um, uh, um, imposing this idea too rigidly on Sefer Tehillim. In other words, I want to be cautious. I don't want to say that every Mizmor fits into this pattern of telling a continuous story. But I do think that if you take a look and you take a little bit of a step back and you begin to look at the structure of the book, what you're going to see is that certain patterns and certain ideas are going to rise, are going to emerge from the book. So let's begin with the structure of the book. What is the structure of the book? So according to our tradition, and I brought it for you here in source number one, Sefer Tehillim is divided into five books. Moshe Natan Chamisha Chumshei Torah L'Yisrael, V'David Natan Chamisha Sfarim Shebetehillim L'Yisrael. Right? Everybody knows that. Yes? Actually, I, I, I taught, I taught uh, Sefer Tehillim last week, and quite a number of people came over to me and said, never knew that Sefer Tehillim was divided into five books. So if you didn't know, you're in good company, right? Sefer Tehillim is, in fact, divided into five books. This is a uh, part of our tradition. Most of the Sifrei Tilim that we use mark the end of the book, right? So it says Sefer Rishon, Sefer Sheni, Sefer Shlishi. But even if you don't have a Sefer Tilim that does that for you, you can easily find the end of the book using the following very um, obvious formula, which is that every book of Sefer Tilim ends with what we call a doxology. A doxology, which is some sort of praise of God, right? Baruch Hashem li'olam, amen ve'amen, right? That is the way in which we close 
each of the five books of Sefer Tehillim. I think if we begin to pay careful attention to the way in which these five books are divided, we are going to begin to see something emerge. But before I get to that, I want to say something else, which is that I guess the first step that we would want to do if we're thinking about the, diff the five books of Tehillim and if there's some sort of pattern going on here, the first thing that we would want to ask is, is, do each of these five books have a distinctive character, right? a distinctive idea? Um, I'm not sure the answer is yes. I like the answer to be yes. But I'm not sure that the answer is yes. There are some general things that you can say about each of these five books. Um, and I'm going to say some of them. Again, I want you to see that as I'm teaching this shiur, I, I'm working out some of these ideas. Right? I'm sharing that with you, that these ideas are new ideas. I spent many, many years teaching Sefer Tehillim in exactly the way that we've always learned Sefer Tehillim, which is that when you teach Perak Chet, you learn Perak Chet. Right? You don't learn Zion and you don't learn Tet. You learn Perak Chet. That's the way that we have always traditionally learn Sefer Tehillim, and I still think that that's the right way to learn Sefer Tehillim. I'm, I'm, I'm questioning now, and I'm beginning to discern that there's another way of approaching it as well, not to replace the proper learning of each of the chapters in its own right, but to begin to see the way in which Sefer Tehillim is organized and to see if we can find meaning in that. Okay. Now, when we talk about each of the five books, so there are a few things that we can say. The first book is David's book. Right? Why do I say it's David's book? Because David appears in almost every one of the titles. Mizmor le David, le David Mizmor, right? Now, out of the 150 Mizmori Tehillim, approximately what percentage does David appear in the title? I'm not going to talk about authorship at all. Right? Not, not, not because I'm afraid of authorship, but because it's a complicated question. I and mean, there's a lot of different midrashim here that, 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 that discuss uh, the different possible authors of Sefer Tilim. Not everybody thinks that David wrote all of them. In fact, most of our, our basic source in Balbatra says that David wrote Sefer Tilim with the Asar, Asaratas Kenim, with, with 10 elders, right? And, and most of the sources seem to go in that direction. I just said I was not going to discuss authorship. Okay, so let's go back to the question of, of David. How, what percentage of the Mizmori Tilim actually have David's name in the title? Exactly half, almost exactly half, right? 73 out of 150. Okay, so that's pretty much 50%. Um, there's a strong concentration of David Mizmarim in the beginning, right? So that in book one, I think all of the Mizmarim, maybe with one or two exceptions, certainly with one, but, but maybe also two exceptions, uh, do not have David's name in the title. Um, also, the second book are almost completely ascribed to David. And now I want you to note what appears at the very end of the second book. So look in Perak Ayin Bet, okay? At the end of the second book, which is Ayin Bet, we have our doxology, which, uh, which begins in Pasuk Yudchet, Baruch Hashem Elokim Elokei Yisrael Osei Niflot Levado, Uvaruch Shem Kvodo Leolam, Vimlei Kvodo Et Kol Haaretz, Amen Vamein. We're going to get some sort of variation of that at the end of every book. But now look at the last Pasuk here, Kolu Tefilot David Ben Yishai. What does that mean? It is a Kavatz Katan here, right? Kolu Tefilot David Ben Yishai. The tefillot of David and Yishai have been completed. It's a strange pasuk, right? And in fact, from here on, we, we, we get a lot less David in the title. Okay, we're still going to find David in some of the titles, but it, 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 in a completely different concentration and a completely different proportion of the Mizmari Tehillim. Okay, so that, those are very general things that I'm saying about the first two books, but I want you to sort of keep that in the back of your mind. And now I want to say a couple things about the next three books. I want to say about book three that this is, this is a really rough book, right? You know, sometimes you encounter Mizmari Tehillim and you say, oh, that hurt, right? That's a really hard Mizmor to read. It's painful. It's asking difficult questions. It's describing a difficult situation that Am Yisrael finds himself in or that the person finds himself in. It's accusatory towards God. A lot of those Mizmori Tehillim, they're found in book three, right? Book three is the most 
difficult book. I'm not saying there aren't difficult mesmeritilene in the other books, right? Um, but book three seems to have the really difficult ones and a heavy concentration of them. Okay, so that's interesting. Keep that in mind as well. Okay, what are we going to say about the fourth uh, book? I'll say two very general things. One is that they're mostly untitled, which is interesting. We have a lot of the Mizmore Tilim that we know from either, uh, you know, Kabbalah Shabbat, Shir Shalyom, right? Um, there's a lot of Malchut Mizmore Tilim in book four, Hashem Malach, right? A lot of those kinds of Mizmore. Right? We're going to go back to all these ideas, but these are really very general ideas. I'm not sure what we're going to do with them yet. I mean, I, I know what we're going to do with them yet, but I'm not going to tell you yet what we're going to do with them. Okay, the, the, the fifth book, okay? The fifth book um, is a book which has a lot of Mizmore Tehilim of praise. Hodu Hashem Kitov Kilam Chasov. It also has Kuf Yutet, which I know you're doing right now, right? That's what you're up to right now. You're right now in the fifth book. You should be feeling good, right? The fifth book is a good book. It has Hallel. It has um, it has Psuke de Zimra. It has the 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 the, the Tehilim of communal praise. They appear in that fifth book. Okay. The Shire Hamalo, right? Um, what, what do we do with all of this, right? Well, we can offer some 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 general ideas, but um, but I, I, I'm, what I'm going to say now is not going to relate to every single mizmor. I'm certainly not going to engage in some sort of attempt to force ideas into every one of the mizmori tilim. But what I do think that we can do is is we can look at the seams of the book. We can look at its skeletal structure. We could look at the beginning and the end of each of these books and see if there's some sort of idea that exists as the as at the periphery in order for us to see some sort of structure emerge from the book. Um, and, and I think that there is. I think that if you look, if you begin to look here at book one, book one is about David. It's not just about David. It's about David in his quest for, I'm going to say his quest for Ashrei, right? His quest for a meaningful life. Ashrei, not happiness, right? But inner peace, deep joy, a life that is infused with meaning, right? A life of gratification. If you look at Perak Aleph, Pasuk Aleph, I'm going to show you how the Mizmor, uh, how the, the, the book is framed by what seems to be this quest. You have Ashrei Ha'ish, Asher Lo Halach Ba'atzat B'Sha'im, right? Happy is the man who does not go in the ways of the evildoer, but instead, what is he doing during the course of his life? He is engaged in a quest, in a desire for Torah Hashem. Look at the words, ki'im b'Torah Hashem chiftso, right? That's in Pasuk Bet, the, the instructions of God, the Torah of God, that is his deep desire. And as we saw, uve Torato yehege yomam falayla. Look now in our Last Mizmor, Mem Aleph Bet, Ashrei Maskil El Dal, right? And now look at Pasuk Yud Bet here, Bezot Yadati Ki Chafatsta Bi. This is how I know, God, that you desired me, right? So both of those words, Ashrei and Chafetz, appear in the beginning and in the end of book one, and I'll show you something else. I think that there is a sense here that book one is about, it is David describing his experience as an individual person who is aspiring to create a life of meaning. A life of meaning is a life in which he searches for God's instructions. And if you look in Perak Mem, which is not the last Mizmor, but the second to last Mizmor, here you have, I think, I think one of the most beautiful psukim that uh, describes uh, what human beings should be yearning for in order to create a, a meaningful life. Um, I, 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 uh, this is in uh, Mizmor Mem, Pasuk Tet. Look at what it says here. Laasot ritzoncha Elohai chafatsti v'toratcha v'toch me'ai. It should remind you of Perak Aleph, right? To do your will, God, I desire, and your Torah 
is in my innards, right? So what seems to frame book one is this sense that David is using this book in order to express his desire for closeness to God, his attempt to create a life that is infused with meaning and that is surrounded by Limud Torah. Okay, so that's for the moment what I want to say about book one. What happens in book two? If the first book is about David's individual experience, the second seems to be more, um, more about David's experience as in his communal role, as a leader. This is the book where we have a heavy concentration of Mizmorim that have a title that links the Mizmor to David's life, to the events that take place in his life, and particularly perhaps David's sense that some of the events in his life may have caused God to cast him off, not to lachpotzbo. What I'm suggesting is not, not that, that God no longer desires him. What I'm suggesting is, in a way, that the first book and the second book seem to clash a little bit. Okay? The first book expresses, I think, a very real desire and perhaps a very realistic um, attempt to create a world of meaning, whereas in the second book, there's a little bit of a sense that David is not sure that he has been successful. This may be describing a less confident David, the one whose life is marked and overshadowed by his sin with Bathsheba, which has such a deep impact on his life. And here what I want to, what I want to show you is, is that even though the story of Bathsheba is certainly by far not the first story that happens to David chronologically, within the cluster of Mizmore Tihilim that appear in book two, the first one is Nun Aleph. The first one is Nun Aleph. Look at Nun Aleph. What is Nun Aleph? The first one that David, the first story that David is describing in book two is Bivo Elav Natan Hanavik Asher Ba El Batsheva. This story of David begins with the moment that the prophet comes to David and rebukes him. And what does David say here in Perak Nun Aleph? Pasuk Yud Gimel, he turns to God and he says, Al tashlicheni milfanecha v'ruach kodshecha al tikach mimeni. The first, the first story that David expresses here, that David describes here, is a story in which he fears that God is going to take his ruach Hashem away from David. This is what happens to David as a result of the story with Bathsheba. Right? We know that when David is anointed in Shmuel Aleph, Perak Tedzayin, we are told, Ruach Hashem, Sarah Me'im Shaul, the Spirit of God leaves Shaul, it rests on David, Me'ayom Hahu Vamala, from that day forward. And here in this Mizmar, David's response to the realization, the sudden realization of what has happened to him as a result of his sin with Bathsheba, his first response is, don't cast me away, God. Don't take your ruach that you promised would rest on me forever. Don't take it away from me. Al tashlecheni milfanecha. I think the subject of this uh, book I think is, is, is basically um, not just David's sin with Bathsheba, but the impact of David's sin with Bathsheba, which of course causes David to question whether or not, in fact, God still desires him in the role that he placed him in. And we see this really all over Shmuel, but I want to draw your attention to one particular, um, uh, one particular incident, and that is when David is running away from Avshalom, Right, Avshalom, his son, has come to Yerushalayim in order to, uh, in order to, to take over, in order to, to do a rebellion, and uh, David runs away. And when David runs away, the Kohen follows him with the Aron Hashem. 
Okay, I want you to see this inside. Look in Shmuel Bet, Perak Ted Zion. <clears throat> now, David is very attached to the Aron Hashem, right? We know that that is uh, um, uh, the Aron Hashem is what David brings to Yerushalayim with great ecstatic singing. David is very particularly attached to the Aron Hashem. And when the Kohen brings the Aron Hashem, sorry, did I say Ted Zion? It's Ted Vav. Shmuel Bet, Perak Ted Vav, Pasuk Kaf Hei. Vayomer HaMelech Litzadok, and the king says to the Kohen Gadol, Hashev et Aron HaLokim Ha'ir. Bring the Aron HaLokim back to the city. Don't bring it with me as I run away from Avshalom. Im emtzachin be'enei Adonai veheshivani vihirani oto ve'et navehu. If, in fact, I will find favor in God's eyes, he'll bring me back and I will see the Aron again. Now look at the next words. V'im koyomar, but if so, says God, lo chafatz dibach, right? It's the opposite of parak mem aleph. If God says, I no longer desire you, hinani aseli kasher atov beinav. It's a very tragic moment. David says, I'm not going to force God's hand. If God has rejected me, then I'm not going to take the aron with me artificially. Who does that? B'nei Eli, when they take the aron into war. David doesn't do that. He says, perhaps God no longer desires me. Perhaps God no longer wants me to have his Ruach Hashem. Perhaps God no longer wants me to have leadership. This is David's major concern. Has God cast him off? Has God taken the Ruach Hashem away from him? At what point does David understand that in fact the kingship is going to continue with him the Ruach Hashem is going to remain with him and his descendants despite the story with Bathsheba, despite the terrible sin with Bathsheba. At what point does he understand? Well, I'll tell you when he doesn't understand it. He doesn't understand it when he's very old, right? When he's very elderly, he's still sunk in the mire of despair. Think of David in Malachim Aleph, Perak Aleph, lying in his bed, cold, not knowing, perhaps not even caring what's going on outside with his son Adoniyahu and his other son Shlomo, right? The sense is, is that he's not sure that there's going to be any continuity, right? He's not investing any effort in obtaining continuity. And the Abarbanel says that this is, and I think it's entirely, uh, seems to be entirely possible, that this is the, this is the continuation of the story of Bathsheba. He, has, he still is not entirely sure that there is going to be any sort of continuity from him as a result of the sin. And I want to show you something that I think is really amazing in Sefer Tehillim, in book two. If the story of David, as, as it's presented in book two, begins with the sin of Bathsheba, with David crying out, Al tashlicheni milfanecha, v'ruach kochecha al tikach mimeni, it ends in Perak Ayin Aleph with the only other place in Tanakh where we have the words Al Tashlicheni. And actually, the Balea Slichot, right? Those who composed the Slichot understood the connection. Look in Perak Ayin Aleph, Pasuk Tet. David, towards the end of the second book, is still concerned that God is going to cast him away. Even in his old age, look in Perak Ayin Aleph Pasuk Tet. Al tashlicheni le'eit zikna, says David. Do not cast me away in my old age. Ki chlot kochi al ta'azveni. So we have basically the whole story of Sefer, of the second Sefer. Certainly it's framed, the story, by David's heartfelt pleas before God. Don't cast me away as a result of my sin with Bacheva. Now look at Ayin Bet. Ayin Bet, our final Mizmor in book two. How does it start? Lishlomo. It's all going to be good, right? This is the Tikkun. Lishlomo. Shlomo gets kingship. The sin of David and Bacheva has been pardoned. There is going to be continuity, not just through David's sons, but through the son of David and Bathsheba. David's tshuva has elicited forgiveness, has drawn him closer to God. Look at Perak Ayin Bet. Perak Ayin Bet is an amazing Perak. It is the Perak 
of the ideal continuity, of the ideal state of the Davidic dynasty. Let's just read part of it. Again, you know, we're somewhat limited. I hope that I'm a little bit whetting your appetite to read these Mizmarim a little bit more deeply. But certainly, when you look at Ayin Bet, Ayin Bet is one of those really just idyllic Mizmarim. The fact that it starts Li Shlomo, I think, is really very, very suggestive, right? After uh, David says, Al tashlichenu don't cast me away in my old age, we have Shlomo. And what is the description of this rule of Shlomo? Look in Pasuk Bet. Yadina amchav v'tzedek. He will judge your nation with righteousness. V'aniyecha v'mishpat. And he will judge your poor people with justice. Yisu harim shalom. There will be peace in the, in the mountains. La'am for the people. Ugva'ot v'tzedaka. And the, and the hills will have righteousness. Yishpot aniyei am yoshia livnei evyon v'yidake he will crush oppression and immorality. Skip ahead, look in Pasuk Zion. Yifrach biyamav tzadik, the righteous one, will flourish in his day. Virov shalom ad bli areach. Viyerd miyam al yam. He will rule from one sea to the other. Uminar ad afsei aret. Lefanav yichreu tziyim veoivav afar yilachechu. Everybody will come and obey him, everybody will come and bow to him, his enemies will eat the dust. etc. etc. Okay, this is just a great mizmor. It's the mizmor of the idyllic situation of the continuation of David. David, in fact, his 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 tfilot, his tshuva has been answered, and therefore, look in Pasuk Kaf, kolu tefilot David ben Yishai. It's all done, right? He did it. It ends with this jubilant crescendo, the triumph, right? So again, you know, the sense is, and I'm not saying that every single means more fits into this, but the sense is, is that the structure creates a certain meaning, right? So that if book one is about trying to create some sort of ideal kind of lifestyle as an individual. In book two, we see how David, in his communal role as leader, is, uh, loses his confidence as a result of his sin, and then eventually um, uh, is, is pardoned by God, and continuity is given through this ideal kingship, which is given to Shlomo. Okay, so that's book two. What happens in book three? Well, book three takes us to the reality, right? If, if book two ends with the ideal Davidic dynasty, book three begins with the reality. The reality is, is that the Davidic dynasty does not maintain that idyllic state of affairs as it is described in Perak Einbet, and I brought it for you here. I charted it for you just to make it a little bit easier for you to see. Look in source number two, right? Einbet and Ein Gimel. Again, there's a very strong linguistic connection between these two Mizmorim. So that in Ein Bet, we have all these ideal words, Shalom, Tzadik, Yidake, Oshek, right? They will crush oppression. Mitochu mechamas, Yigal nafsham. He will save them from Hamas, right? And what do we have in Perak Ein Gimel? Shalom Rishaim Ere. We don't have the tzaddik anymore. And we don't have shalom. Who actually is prospering? Who actually is finding peace? It's the evil, right? Shalom Rishaim, Hine'ele Rishaim. Yamiku, look in, look in the third uh, box there, on the right side. Yamiku vidabru vira oshek mimarom yidaberu. That's Pasukhet, right? There's oshek. But, but, but the ideal king was supposed to crush oshek, oppression. In reality, book three opens with oppression. It opens with evil. It opens with the prospering of evil. It opens with Hamas, right? It opens with the shalom, which is an illusory shalom, right? It's not a real shalom. And what we have here really is, um, book three is really about the downfall of the Davidic dynasty, which we know doesn't last. It does not maintain the idyllic hopes of Ayin Bet. 
And um, I mentioned before that this is certainly the most negative of the five books. It's the most frightening. It's the harshest one. It's filled with difficult mizmorim, mizmorim which are about uh, oppression and destruction and violence, about the destruction of Jerusalem. Right? We're not just talking about David's time. Certainly not. Right? Look at Ayin Dalid, for example. Okay? Look at Ayin Dalid. It starts out as follows. Maskil le'asaf. Lama Elohim zanachta lanetzach? Why, God, will you endure, will you, will you keep your anger for eternity? Will, your, will you smoke with anger against the, your flocks? Right? Zechor um, Adat, wait, um, look in Pasuk Zayin. Shilchu va'esh mikdashecha. They sent fire into your mikdash. La'aretz chililu mishkan shmecha. Right? This, this is about 586 BCE. This is about the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash. You see it again in Ayin Tet. Look in Ayin Tet. This is the very first pasuk. Mizmor la'asaf Elohim. Ba'u goyim b'nachalatecha. Tim'u et heichal kodshecha. Samu et Yerushalayim la'iyim. Right? These nations came into your mikdash. They came into your portion. They have, they have uh, made your heichal, your holy place, impure. They have destroyed Yerushalayim, which is now in ruins. This is the, this is the general atmosphere of book three. Book three is about the crash into reality. If book two ends with high hopes, with a lot of optimism about the future of the Davidic dynasty, the continuation of David through Shlomo and David's descendants, book three is a book that is about the how incomprehensible the, the, the story of suffering is, the story of Am Yisrael's suffering is, and the destruction of Am Yisrael and Yerushalayim despite all of the hopes that we had at the end of book two. This, this entire book, book three, is filled with heart-rending rhetorical questions. Lama, ad ma, ad matai, right? These are the questions that are being asked. We are hurling accusations against God. It is filled with pleas for God to not do what he is doing. Al, 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 do not, do not, do not. There's a very harsh descriptions of destruction throughout book three. And most significant of all, book three ends with Perak Peitet. Perak Peitet. So let's look. I mean, I think that the seams are really very important here, right? The opening means more, the closing means more. These are very important for us getting a little bit of a sense of how the, 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 the skeletal structure of the book indicates to us the progression of the book, the trajectory of the book. So Perak Peitet. Perak Peitet is a really rough mizmor. It is such a rough mizmor that the Ibn Ezra, actually, in his uh, commentary to this mizmor, tells us something very interesting. It's, it's, it's anecdotal, making it very interesting. The Ibn Ezra says, as follows, I didn't bring it for you on your source sheet. I think that I quoted this, actually, um, when I was teaching Chavakuk. Right, which might have been either the last time or two times ago that I came here. I don't know if anybody remembers. I think I believe that I quoted this Ibn Ezra, but I'm going to quote it again because it's very relevant for us here. The Ibn Ezra says as follows: He says, "Vahiyat is farad, chacham gadol v'chasid." In Spain, there was a great chacham. He was very pious. V'zeham is more, and this means more. Pay ten, eighty-nine. Hayalav kashet. He thought this was a, this was hard for him. V'lo hayak koreoto. He refused to read this mizmor. The lo ayaya holy shmo. He couldn't even listen to it. This was a really hard mizmor. He refused to say it. You know who this chacham was? <laughs> Probably. We think we know who it was because of other places where the Ibn Ezra quotes this chacham echad. Rabbi Yudah Levi, the Bala Kuzari. He couldn't say this mizmor. If it wasn't him, it's another chacham gadol v'chasid, right? But, I mean, the idea of saying, well, you know, I'll do 149, but that, that one, that one I'm not doing, right? It, it, it suggests that this mizmor is really very troubling. And this mizmor is really very troubling. I'll tell you why it's very troubling. The first part of the mizmor is great, right? Uh, I mean, the first part, I mean the first 39 or so psukim, right? It's a great mizmor. Let's start from the beginning, right? He begins by singing of God's 
Chesed ve'emunah. Chesed ve'emunah. That's the phrase that appears over and over throughout the Mizmor. What is chesed ve'emunah? It means loyalty. It means faithfulness. It means trustworthiness. We are saying to God, you are loyal. You are faithful. You are true to your word. That's what we're saying over and over. What word is God faithful to? The promise that he gives the Davidic dynasty that they will maintain kingship forever. Why is that? Why do I say that that's the chesed ve'emunah? Because that's what it says throughout the Mizmar. Let's, let's look inside. We start by, in Pasuk Aleph, Pasuk Bet, really, chasdei Hashem olam ashira ledor vador ode emunatecha. Right? I'm going to keep talking about God. chesed and emunah. Pasuk Bet, ki amarti olam chesed yibane shamayim tachin emunatecha emunatecha vahem. Right? Again, chesed and emunah. We're going to skip ahead. I just wanted you to see how many times that phrase appears. But to get a real sense of the Mizmor, we have to skip ahead a little bit. Just look in Pesach Tedvav for a moment. Tzedek umishpat mechon kisecha, right? Righteousness and justice. That is your throne. That's, that's, that's your definition. Chesed ve'emet yikadimu fanecha. Chesed ne'emet, chesed emuna. This is the phrase, this is the word pair that keeps jumping out at us in this Mizmor. What is it that God is meant to be faithful to? Look in Pasuk Kaf Aleph. No, Pasuk Kaf. Az dibarta v'chazon v'chasidecha. In those days, you spoke with a vision to those who were pious. V'tomer, shiviti ezer al gibor harimoti v'chor me'am. I lifted up this fine young man. Matsati David Avdi. It is one of the rare occasions where David actually appears in the body of the Mizmor. It's pretty rare in Mizmor Tehillim. Hey, Matsati David Avdi, b'shemen kodshim meshachtiv. I anointed him. Asher yadi tikon imo avzroi tamtsenu. My hand will be with him. My my right arm will strengthen him. Lo yasi lo yashi oyevo venavla lo yanenu. Nobody's going to be able to conquer him. Vechatot imi panav tsarav. I'll destroy all of his enemies. Umisanav ego veemunati vechasdi imo. You see it again. Chesed veemuna. Uvi shmi tarum karno. I will be faithful to him. Visam tiva yam yadov and arot imi no. I will make him successful wherever he goes, wherever he conquers. He will call me his father. I will make him my eldest son. I will always keep my faithfulness to him. My covenant is with him forever. His descendants will be for eternity. You see the problem, obviously, right? His throne is supposed to be like, like the heavens, eternal, forever. And he's going to say it even more explicitly. Look in Pasuk Lamedal. I will never take away my chesed. I do not lie with my emunah. says God. I will not change my word. I will never violate my promises. I have sworn this. It can't get more explicit than that. His descendants will be forever. Okay, it's going to be eternal. That's God's promise. By the way, look here in source number four, just for those of you who want to look at this on your own time, I, sh I'm, I, I show in this chart that this entire Mizmor is built on Shmuel Bet Perik Zion. Shmuel Bet Perik Zion is where God tells David, I'm going to give you eternal reign to you and to your family. I'm going to create a dynasty of kings. And, and the language here is just drawn from Shmuel Bet Perik Zion. This is a very extensive chart. You don't even have to read it to get a sense of how deeply uh, our Mizmor is based on Shmuel Bet Perik Zion. But here's the crux. Until this moment, it's all good. God's promising. He's promising. He's saying again and again and again. Chesed ve'emunah, chesed ve'emunah, chesed ve'emunah. Starting in Pasuk Lamed Tet, this becomes a very, very difficult Mizmor. 
ואתה זנחת ותמאס. You rejected, you spurned. התעברת עם משיחך. You became very angry with your anointed one. נארת ברית עבדיך. You spurned the covenant that you made with your servant. חיללת לארץ נזרו. You threw his crown on the ground. You profaned his crown. פרצת כל גדרותיו. You broke through all of his fences. שמת מבצריו מחיטה. שעשו כל עוברי דרך. היה חרפה לשכניו. Everybody came and trampled on him. He was a, a, a shame, a mockery to his neighbors. הרי מוטה ימין צרב. הסמכת כל אויביו. אף תשיב צור חרבו. לא כמוטה במלחמה, etc, etc. לא כן פסק מ"ו. הקצרת ימי עלומיו. You made his eternal life that he was supposed to have short, right? You covered him with shame. Till when, God, are you going to hide yourself forever? You are going to burn your anger like fire. Now, skip ahead to Pasuk Nun and look at what happens. This is the end of book three, and it's the end of this Very difficult, Mizmar. Ayei chasadecha harishoni. Where is that chesed that you promised, Adonai? Nishpata l'david be'emunatecha. Where is it? Where'd it go? Where's the chesed? Where's the emunah? It's gone. That's book three. Book three is a book in crisis. It's a crisis that emerges from a very real crisis of biblical history. It's the crisis of the collapse of the Davidic dynasty, of the collapse of this promise of eternity to the Davidic kings. And along with that, of course, the destruction of Yerushalayim and the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash, the promise that God makes to David in Shmuel Bet, Perak Zion, seems to be in jeopardy. <laughs> or seems to have been violated. I think you can understand why this Chacham and Chassid in Sfarad doesn't like this Mizmor. This is a very audacious, I would call it a Chutzpahdik Mizmor, and you know, that's if I'm being nice, right? This is a very, very difficult Mizmor, and uh, it ends, of course, with the sense of all that Chesed and Emunah that you promised, it's gone, where is it, what happened? Okay, within this schema, we have to understand Book four. Okay, so let's turn to book four. Book four opens with Tfilah le Moshe, Ish Elohim. This is a Mizmor that we all know. I think many of us also really relate to this Mizmor, right? Because this Mizmor contains some of those preeminent questions that we humans deal with, like, you know, why do we only live such a short time? We're sort of a blip in history, right? This is the Mizmor that has that famous Pasuk, right? Yemei Shnei HaAdam Shiv'im Shana. V'im b'gvurot shmonim shana, right? The days of man's life are maybe 70 years, if we're really lucky, 80. I might play with the numbers nowadays, right? And, and make them a little longer. Yemei shnei adam mea shana, right? V'im b'gvurot mea v'asrim shana. But it's still a blip, right? We're still, we're still dealing with the same problem. Um, the the, the, the Mizmor seems to be about the brevity of human existence, right? Um, and, and this Mizmor opens a series of ten Mizmorim that Chazal attribute to Moshe. Okay, so Chazal, I brought for you here in source number three, uh, it's really 11 Mizmorim. It takes us through um, uh, Kuf, right, but including Kuf, so it's Achadasar Mizmorim Amar Moshe. Okay, so we seem to have, at least according to Chazal, a certain progression here or a certain cluster a collection of Moshe Mizmorim. The only one that really has Moshe's name in it is the first one, but this at least seems to be an idea that suggests that we should look at these first 11 Mizmorim as part of one unit. What is this unit really coming to teach us? I don't think that Mizmor Tzadi is coming to deal primarily with the age-old problem of human transience. That, that problem is dealt with all over Tanakh, right? So Kohelet obviously deals with that problem, right? And Ishayahu has some dealings with that problem. We have that problem in Eo, right? It's a real problem. It's a real philosophic question that all human beings ask. But I don't think that that's what Mizmor Tzadi is dealing with. I think Mizmor Tzadi 
is contending with the question of how to exist in a world in which eternality was promised to Am Yisrael through the medium of the eternality of the Davidic dynasty. And it is no longer, right? The, 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 the sense that eternality has been taken away from us at the end of the third book, right? You shortened his eternal existence. That, I think, is what's being contended with at, in, in Perak Tzadi. And it accounts for something very strange in Perak Tzadi, right? I mean, we read this. We read this every week, right? This is, this is a mizmor that we're familiar with. And, and when we're talking about human transience, it's always very jarring that suddenly we're talking about God's anger. You, you familiar with what I'm talking about? Look in Pasuk um, Vav, right? Uh, sorry, Pasuk Zion. Ki chalinu ve'apecha, for we were destroyed in your anger. And in your anger, we were, we, were, we were taken away. We were panicked. You placed our sins before you. All of our days passed by in your anger. Just a lot of anger here. A lot of punishment. I think that this mizmor is on one level giving an answer to what happened to the Davidic dynasty. It didn't remain eternal because of God's anger. I think that that's one way to understand this mizmor. But more important for our purposes or for my purposes is that I think that book four largely or certainly in terms of its overall sense or maybe it's, uh, it's, 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 it's some of its uh, skeletal structure should be seen as dealing with the crisis of book three, the problem of the collapse of the Davidic dynasty in light of God's promises and in light of biblical history. And I think that the, the, the Mizmorim here in book four allow us to deal with this problem in several ways. First of all, they teach us to find eternality in God not in any human institution. Human institutions are by definition transient. They are in flux because human beings are fallible. The only true eternity is God. And we see that throughout these Mizraim. I'll give you a few examples. Look, for example, in Perek uh, Tzadi Bet, Pasuk Tet, Ve'ata, Marom, Le'olam Hashem, you God in heaven, you are forever, right? That's Mizmor Shir, Leoma Shabbat. Look in Tzadi Gimel, Pasuk Gimel, Nachon Kisacha Me'az. Your throne has been established from eternity. Me'olam Ata, right? You have always been, right? Um, uh, Pasuk Hey, Eidotecha Ne'emnu Me'od, Levetcha Nava Kodesh Hashem Le'orech Yamim, right? God is for the length of days. This is an idea that arises over and over throughout these Mizmorim, teaching us that if we want to intuit our lives in something eternal, it is not a human institution, but it is only God. The second point that we see over and over in these Mizmorim, and I think it's really a very strong point, is that these are the Mizmorim, of Hashem Malach. These Mizmarim tell us to focus our attention not on the human institution of kingship, but rather on God as king, for, I think, very obvious reasons. One of which is to show us that the reason that the Davidic dynasty collapsed is not, God forbid, because of God's lack of ability, right, because of his lack of power, but rather it is a deliberate punishment, and we still can rely on God as king. I want to show you a couple of these examples. And this is really, I think, very strongly positioned throughout these Mizmori Tilim. So look, for example, in Tzadi Vav Yud. Are you able to follow me? Am I going too fast? Look at Tzadi Vav Yud, Hashem Malach. Look in Tzadi Zayin Aleph, 
Hashem Malach, look in Tzadi Chet. Vav, Lifnei HaMelech Hashem, look in Tzadi Tet Aleph, Hashem Malach. Look in, I mean, this is, you know, I think the, the idea that we keep saying over and over and over. It's an answer. It's an answer to Pei Tet. In Pei Tet, we are bemoaning the loss of the Davidic dynasty. And the answer of Book 4 is to say, God's majesty is eternal. If you want to follow a king, if you want to have, uh, to intuit your life in some sort of eternity of a king, that is only God. Now, the third point that I think that we find in these uh, Mizmorim here in Book 4 is, um, is that, is, well, look in, in Sadi Bet, Pasuk Gimel. Look at what we have here. This is Mizmor Shir Liyom HaShabbat. Tov l'odot l'Hashem, l'zamei l'shimcha hayom, l'hagid b'boker chastecha ve'emunatcha b'leilot. Okay? These Mizmorim here are giving us once again the ability to reacquire our belief in chesed and emunah through presenting God's eternity, through presenting God's majesty, by giving us the support um, of, of, of God's presence in the aftermath of the terrible crisis of the collapse of the Davidic dynasty, we begin to reacquire our chesed and our emunah. And if you look at the last of those 11 Mizmarim that Chazal say were written by David, look at the last pasuk of Mizmor Kuf. It's one that we say every day, right? So maybe we'll say it a little bit differently tomorrow. It's Mizmor L'toda, Hari L'Hashem Kol Ha'aretz. Look in pasuk, hey, Ki tov Hashem le'olam chasdo ve'ad dor v'ador emunato. We have arrived once again at the belief in chesed ve'emunah, in God's faithfulness, in God's uh, uh, loyalty, in God's fidelity, in his kindness to us. Okay, so this is part of, I think, the process. That's part of the process of biblical history. It's part of the process of the history of Am Yisrael, even not biblical history, right? Um, it's filled with crisis and, um, and, and perhaps also uh, oftentimes a certain amount of, of anger at God, a certain amount of confusion within the experience of, of, of loss and tragedy and destruction. And then it's about the repair of the relationship in the aftermath of the crisis. And that's what we see happening in Book 4. Book four ends with the promise or the request, the hope for God's deliverance, for God to gather up the exiles and restore Am Yisrael once again. Look at the very end of book four, which is Mizmor Kuf Vav, right? Pasuk Mem Zayin, right before our doxology. Look at the last pasuk, Peret Kuf Vav, Pasuk Mem Zayin, Hoshienu Hashem Alokenu, Vikabetseinu Min Hagoyim. Right? Save us, God, and gather us up from among the nations. Lehodot Lishem Kochecha, Lihishtabeach, Betilatecha. Why should you gather us up? So that we can praise God, so that we can continue to sing the praises of God to His name. And now let's look at how our fifth book opens, the book of communal praise, of communal prayer, of Hodu Hashem Kitov Kilalam Chasto. Let's look at our first two psukim of Kuf Zayin. Hodu Hashem Kitov. We start to praise God. That's what we had prayed. We said, Hoshienu Hashem Elokecha v'kabtseinu min agoyim lehodot l'shem kodjecha l'ishtabach betilatecha. We ask God to bring us back so that we can praise Him. Book five opens with Hodul Hashem Kitov Kilalam Chasto Yomru Geulei Hashem Asher Gealam Miad Tsar. So we're moving now towards a resolution of biblical history, or perhaps a resolution of Jewish history. And now we launch book five, which is a book that is saturated with communal praise of God. And so I want to conclude 
by, um, by, by a little bit giving a sense of what it is that we've seen tonight. When, when, when you look at the skeletal structure of the book, it does seem that the book of Tehillim doesn't just have purposeful sequence or purposeful um, uh, uh, composition, but that it really does have some sort of sequential idea, some sort of story that underlies it. It seems to be the story of biblical history. It perhaps is also the story of the Jewish people as told from the human perspective. This book shares the story of the hopeful beginnings of individual man, of human beings who seek to saturate their life with meaning, with Torah, with desiring God and having God in turn desire us. It continues with crisis, the crisis of David, followed by his tshuva, his pleas to God, followed by forgiveness and perhaps also some sort of national renaissance. After that, we have a national crisis. We have exile. We have the way in which this affects us religiously, the confounding mizmorim of book three, in which the people express their lack of comprehension as a result of all of these terrible events that have happened. And ultimately, it concludes with a profound belief in the ability to repair the relationship between people and God, to bring about the redemption, and ultimately to conclude with praise. I think that even though, as I said in the beginning of the shiur, I would still teach the Mizumare Te'ilim, each of the chapters, as an independent unit. I certainly think that that is uh, certainly one of the ways, perhaps the best way, to learn deeply the messages of each of the Mizumare Te'ilim. But I think that when you take a step back and when you see the progression of Sefer Te'ilim, you see something that is an enduring and critical message, one that perhaps is particularly resonant for us here on the eve of the Yamim Naraim as we're taking a step back and thinking about some of the ways in which we function both as individuals and as members of a community in our interactions with God throughout history, and especially at this period of Jewish history when perhaps we've uh, had the opportunity to arrive at the beginning of book five. So I'm very happy that you are here uh, saying, uh, uh, engaged right now in studying book five. And with, uh, with, with tefillot and with brachot, I'll conclude with tefillot and with brachot, that we should continue to be in book five and be praising God as a community.